Hey guys, Kim here, and you are tuned into Kim E, the Diabetes MP, a place where nurse practitioners can come and discuss and tighten up on their diabetes management skills. Now today, I kind of want to take it back a little bit, okay? Um, when I first started this cha uh, channel about a year ago, I really went over the diabetic medications, the medications that treat diabetes, and I went over each individual drug class. And if you haven't seen those videos, I went over, like I, get, like I said, every class, I made a playlist of it, so I'll put it in the, in the description box. But here recently, I've been getting some questions and really been a part of some conversations where I'm starting to see that people are having difficulty as to navigating um, what is the next medication that you should go to if metformin does not work. I think everybody is clear on the fact that metformin is the first line drug. We all know that. But what if that is not doing the job for your patient? What if your patient can't tolerate uh, metformin? What if you need to do dual therapy or triple therapy? I'm seeing that a lot of people are not feeling very comfortable, even nurse practitioners that um, have been doing this for a while. And so I want to take this month to really go over just um, different medications and what our mindset, well, my, well medication mindset, I guess, I guess guess that's what I would call it. <laughs> but really what you should be considering when you are going to prescribe a medicine to a diabetic patient, okay? And so just follow me. Today, what I would like to talk about are prescribing considerations. What are the questions that you would ask yourself to help you kind of work your way through what medication would be best for that diabetic? And then later on in the month, the videos to come, I want to talk about the dysfunction that happens in the body that causes hyperglycemia and something that's called the ominous octet. OK, and like I said, that's going to be in videos to come. It's going to be a two part video. Um, but the thing about the ominous octet is depending on where the dysfunction in the body is, it'll really give you a roadmap as to what medicine would best be suited for that diabetic patient. So all that is to come. But today, let's get into the prescribing considerations and prescribing the right diabetic medication. Now, just a little overview and a little bitty disclaimer, okay? Now, this is not the video where I'm going to go into the individual drug classes. Again, I've done that before. I've done a quick overview of each drug class. I will link that in the description box. So I'm not going to be talking about individual medications. This is really just kind of like a decision tree and questions you can consider when you're like, okay, so I have this patient in front of me. What is it that I know about this patient after doing your assessment and speaking with the patient? What would be my next medicine what would be the right medicine um, when I'm treating this diabetic okay and little disclaimer before anybody comes for me because I know there are people that feel like we push medications a lot I just want to let y'all know I totally understand that I agree I do feel like we over prescribe medications in America I feel that way very deeply but the truth of the matter is is that some patients are going to need medications and because we know that that's the inevitable for some people we're not going to get around not prescribing medications medicines legally to people when we know that a, a chronic disease is not under control we need to be very knowledgeable in the medications that we do prescribe when it is appropriate but again um I am all for lifestyle modifications and nutritional counseling. I have done a myriad of different videos on this very channel that covers that. I think if you have been following me for a while, you should definitely know that I'm all for that. But the truth of the matter is, is that every patient is not going to be cured or treated with just lifestyle modifications. And so we have to be knowledgeable about medications. And so this video is 
is for that patient. When you find yourself having to prescribe medicines, what is the right medication that I should go forth in light, knowing that the algorithm is going to tell us, give us a little bit of a map as to do it. But with the algorithm, you may have options. And you can pick one of two, one of three medications, which one would you go to if metformin is not tolerated, it's not cutting the job, it's not cutting it, what would you go to? This is what this video is. And so sorry if this is a little bit of a lengthy intro, but I really want to be very clear with you guys um, what this video is and what I'm going to be discussing. So let's go ahead and get into um, those tips. OK, and the things that you can be asking yourself when it comes to what to prescribe. OK, OK, so I have my little trusty list right here because y'all know I love to make notes and uh, I want to make sure I don't get, I don't forget anything. Um, and so I've just jotted down about seven considerations, seven questions that you can ask yourself and things to consider. Now, keep in mind, this is not all inclusive. OK, you may very well in your mind as I'm talking, you can think of something else. And if you do feel free to drop it in the uh, drop it in the comments. But so we all can learn. OK, but these are just some of the high things when I'm thinking about a patient. What are the things that I'm considering when it comes to this patient? OK, so number one, first things first is which glucose level is abnormal? OK, is it the fasting um, blood glucose? Is it the postprandial blood glucose? And this is important because depending upon how long the patient has been dealing with hyperglycemia, one of those two can be one of those two will be ab abnormal. In some cases, they both can be abnormal, but there are medications that target more so the fasting blood glucose than the postprandial and vice versa. There are medicines like the maglutinides, for instance, because if you have watched my videos, you'll know that the sulfonylureas and the maglutinides are very similar in what they do, but the sulfonylureas are more long acting and the maglutinides are more short acting. And so the sulfonylureas target more of the fasting blood glucose than the maglutinides. And you would typically want a person who is taking a maglutinide to take it around when they're eating because it will target the postprandial glucose. And these are the things that you want to keep in mind when you are thinking about, OK, so what is the best medicine, the next medicine for this patient? Number two, how much is this med going to lower the A1C? OK, now we got to understand this because you may have a med you may have a patient that has an A1C that is high, much higher than the goal. OK, and again, with diabetics, their individual goals, depending on their age, their comorbidities, you may not want to bring that A1C down as quickly with one person as you may with the other. You may, you know, allow a higher um, A1C in one person over another person. Hey, everybody's individualized. OK, and so you really got to take each diabetic case by case. But it's always good to know with these drug classes, how much does the A1C come down? Now, one of the reasons why metformin and insulin in the GLP-1 RAs are high up on the algorithm is because they bring down the A1C one, two points. OK, all right. So that is a huge jump. If somebody has an eight, of an A1C and this medication can bring it down or will bring it down two points. They go from an eight to a six. OK, they go from having, you know, having diabetes, narrowing their chances of being put on insulin, you know, or multiple drugs at one time to going to being to being in the pre-diabetic phase. OK, so you want to keep that in mind because there are some drug classes that give you very minimal, minimal decline, like 0.4, 0.5, 0.8 percent. And when you have someone who has a long way to go to get to target, you may not want to start them on that medication. And to be quite honest with you, again, the algorithm takes that in consideration. OK, that's 
part of why the algorithm is what it is. You'll see some medications higher on the, the list than others, and that's one of the reasons why. Number three, the preferred route of administration. Now, you can say, let's take a patient that is already kind of leery about the fact that they have to even take medications. If you go straight to, I'm going to put you on an injectable, not insulin. I'm going to put you on an injectable, a GLP one RA. Um, even though that's high up on the algorithm, people may have aversions to sticking themselves every day. And I'll be honest with you. I've had many patients that when I have done like a med reconciliation with them, they, I think people can think that if you have to inject yourself with something, you're automatically on insulin. And I've had to actually educate people like this actually is not insulin. Like this trulicity is not insulin. Okay. This is just another medicine. You just happen to have to inject it. But um, I've had many people where I've had to educate them on that you're not on insulin and people will really think that they're on insulin only because they're injecting themselves with something. And so there are people who have aversions to needles and you do have to keep that in mind. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is that a medication can be the best thing for a person. But if they don't take it, it does them no good. At the end of the day, if we want patient adherence, we do need to hear our patients as to what they would like to take. And if you have a patient that has an aversion to needles, you know, in the bigger scheme of things, eventually that patient may have to be on insulin. We don't know. OK, um, but that is a conversation that you would have with your patient is that, well, to keep you from doing X, Y, and Z. And this is not a, like for one, we do have to educate our patients that if you're injecting yourself, if you're on insulin, that's not a punishment, okay? We, it's not a punishment to be on insulin, okay? And we really have to be mindful with our words, but you do need to be very open and honest with your patients that you may have to be on something that you have to inject. But if you do have some time where, okay, we can try out some other, other oral medications that are effective, then you want to keep that in consideration, the route of administration. Okay. Number four, risk of hypoglycemia. Now, at the end of the day, there are different groups of people that are at more of a risk for hypoglycemia. There are medications that if you pair together, they will be, you will put the patient at more of a risk for hypoglycemia. There are orals and injectables, i.e. insulin, that will put somebody at risk for hypoglycemia. And so when you're thinking about what medicine you want to add, you do need to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, we do know that older patients are more at risk for having hypoglycemia. We also, uh, some of that has to do with the decline in kidney function, liver function, and the, the medicine can linger a little longer. Their clearance is not as um, quick as someone who is younger. And so you have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about a patient or even someone who just has chronic chronic kidney disease or something like that their ability to clear it out because if they if it's a medication like a sulfonylurea that medication can linger a while and if they're not clearing it out that puts them at an even higher risk for hypoglycemia so as you can see the wheels in your mind have to start turning and turning and to really say okay is this person at risk for hypoglycemia that is something that you can consider. Number five, cost of medication. So I will say that pretty much the majority of the time that I have been a nurse practitioner, I have dealt with a demographic that was primarily Medicare, Medicaid, um, lower socioeconomic class. Um, and basically a lot of people didn't have a lot of money to just purchase medications out of pocket. Most of the patients have not been on commercial insurance and, um, they really had to be basically whatever ins their insurance, Medicare, Medicaid pay for, that's what they would get. Um, people could not cover the costs 
because the insurance didn't cover it, they couldn't cover it. And so for me and the patients that I have seen over the years, cost of medication is a big thing. And I can probably suspect that it's probably a big thing for a lot of you that are watching this video. You have to keep that in mind, okay? Now there are some ways to get in around it, but it's a very tricky thing because depending upon what county you're in and what state you're in, it could cost totally different. One drug class can be totally different for one area than it is for another area, okay? And one of the things that I did to kind of combat this was if I knew that I was seeing a certain type of insurance, I tried to make sure that when I got time, little bit by little bit, I would call around to kind of really make myself, I would really try to make sure that I was very, knowledgeable of what the tiers were for them. Okay. And your local pharmacist can help you a lot with this. Um, one of the first jobs that I had in primary care, there was a pharmacy that was connected to the clinic and that pharmacist was like my best friend because I would call him. He was on speed dial and I would call him from my office, from my charting station and be like, Hey, I got this patient that is this type of plan Would this medicine work for for them. And he would always always look it up for me and it would be like a quick five minutes you know and so you can do that but i also realize everybody doesn't have the time to do that if you're in a very busy environment um there are things that you can look up you can print off off things for the different insurance companies that will tell you what the tiers are but you do have to keep in mind the cost of medication one of the things that people say about GLP ones uh, is that they're good medicines and they're high up on the algorithm, but they're expensive. Okay. And it's not the only medication that's like that either. It works, but we can't pay for it. Now, of course, you can have a relationship, you know, of course, drug reps come in all the time and you can try to get as many samples as possible from the different reps. You can call them. You can have different, you know, um, there's different community resources where maybe companies would want to sponsor so many of your patients and stuff like that. But again, the resources may not be there for every patient that needs it. And so that is something that you got to keep in mind if the patient can afford it or not, because there's really no point of prescribing it if you know they can't buy it all right number six side effect profile okay what are the side effects okay now each drug no matter what you're taking diabetic or not comes with some type of precaution side effect something like that and the thing is with side uh side effects that um, one of my biggest things too is if it's not tolerated well the patient's probably most likely not going to take it um a lot of times um, in my current role that I'm in now, I am not a primary care provider. I'm, I am in community health and I am able to talk with the patient about their health, okay? And one of the things that I often have to tell patients is when they tell me, well, I take this, but this makes my stomach hurt or I take this and it made my legs hurt. I always ask the patient, did you tell your primary care provider that? Because a lot of times patients will keep that to themselves and we actually have to ask them, are you taking your medications the way that they are prescribed every single day, the way that I prescribe them to you? And you'll be surprised. A lot of people, they won't take their medicines, but this is one of the reasons why a lot of people stop taking their medications is because of side effects. And especially if it's, it's making them tired, it's making them weak, it's making them um, have stomach or GI issues, um, if they can't walk, things like that, people are going to stop taking that because that takes away from the quality of life. And so you have to keep that in mind and you have to make sure that you're asking and you're screening people and asking them about, are you experiencing anything, letting them know what side effects may come and also letting them know that, okay, after you take it for a certain while, it will go away. That's what a self-limiting um, side effect is like with, um, metformin metformin can make a person have the metallic taste 
Okay, you want to tell your patient that, that that could happen to you. But don't worry if that happens. You're not having uh, anaphylactic shock or nothing like that. Don't worry about it. After a few days, it will go away. It should go away. If it does not after this point in time, let me know. But you do want to let people know because the more they know, the better it will be. Okay. And lastly, number seven, consider comorbidities. Now, some of the drug classes, if a patient has chronic kidney -ish issues and their GFR is a certain level, i.e. metformin, you wouldn't want to start it. OK, even if it is first line, you wouldn't want to start it. And there's other things out there, too. If a person has had a history of a certain type of cancer, there's things that you would not want to start in them because it, you know, some things If a person has congestive heart failure. There's medicines, TZZ, TZDs. You're not going to start those in those patients. OK, that will start helping you check stuff off like, OK, this medicine is not good for this patient. This is not an ideal medication for that patient. Those are the things that will help you work through your process of elimination and your decision tree as to what the right medication is. Okay, guys, that's all I have for you. I hope that this was an insightful video. I hope that this gave you some ideas of some ways that you can narrow down what medication would be right for your diabetic patient. If you have not already, Go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. I would love for you to be a part of the family here. Also, if you haven't already, I've put together a collection of just free guides and free cheat sheets that have a lot of different of the basics the basic foundations of diabetes management. And I compiled it all together in what I call the NP Diabetes Starter Pack. It's absolutely 100% free. And all you would need to do is just sign up for it and I'll email it over to you. It has everything from a free mini insulin course. It has the different cheat sheets for each individual um, drug class it has goal settings for your clinic and for your patients and a myriad of other things too it's just a lot of stuff in it and here in the coming weeks i'm going to be adding some more things and so if you're interested in that go to the link in the description box sign up for that and i'll email that right on over to you also if you happen to do social media i am heavily on instagram at the diabetes np and i post over there almost daily you know, I'm over there often and I do little little tips and tricks and all little things, little tidbits and just resources that I come across over there as well. That's more of a shorter form um, of resources that I share over there. But come on over there and be a part of my social media family. Again, like I said, in the coming weeks, in the next video, I'm going to actually be talking about the ominous octet. And I'm very excited about that because that is something that when I was going through nursing school, it wasn't something that I remember being spoken being taught about okay and over the years it has changed and morphed and so we've learned more and so at this point we have more knowledge over the dysfunction that happens that causes hyperglycemia so make sure that not only that you're subscribed but you ding that bell so you will get the notification when i upload those videos now before i log off there is one more thing that I do want to cover with you guys. One little tidbit that I always make sure that I have to tell you. Let us never, ever leave a nurse behind. Bye, guys.